Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Lauren Gates, uh, your host for this evening's Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series. Uh, the topic is the acute TMD patient, along with my special co-host, Dr. Ben Moralia. And tonight, we welcome our special guest and friend, Dr. Michael Gelb. So welcome, Michael. We're so excited to have you. Thank you, Lauren. Great to be right. here. Thank you. So Dr. Gelb is a world-renowned TMJ and sleep specialist with practices in both New York City and White Plains. Dr. Gelb is the co-author of GASP, which we all know and love. So that's available on Amazon. Uh, I recommend that to all my patients. And Airway Health the Hidden Path to Wellness, and the co-founder of both the Foundation for Airway Health and the American Academy, Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry. The Gelb Center was founded over 30 years ago by Dr. Michael Gelb's father, Dr. Harold Gelb. Since then, Dr. Michael Gelb has taken his father's findings to the next level through his airway-centric integrated therapy. He invented the ACG airway-centric system with the help of prosomnus sleep technologies. The ACG system is the first day and night dental appliance solution that offers an integrated approach to addressing airway issues. The professional pain team led by Dr. Michael Gelb integrates physical therapy, myofunctional therapy, craniosacral therapy, and CBCT in their treatment regimen and focuses on health, wellness, and performance. Dr. Gelb is also the co-founder of the AAPMD, a collaborative multidisciplinary organization dedicated to airway, sleep, breathing, and early intervention. His specialties are headaches, fatigue, snoring, TMG, and sleep apnea. So welcome. I think that, I think it's almost nine wow. o'clock, right? I think yeah, wow. Time. I think it's over. All right, it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I did want to just give you all of the, um, the credits and let's just dive right in. We have a busy hour. We're going to start with Dr. Um, Gelb's TED Talk top style on treating the acute patient. And then we're going to follow up with a collaborative case that Dr. Moralia and Dr. Gill worked on together and talk a little bit about collaborative care. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the forum, Dr. Gelb, to share your screen and let's dive right in with the acute TMD patient. Sounds good. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. And Ben, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Ben and I have worked together, uh, you know, in the office together and uh, it's really an honor to be here with everybody. So tonight I'm talking about uh, something new, something old and something new. We call it the Tau Method. And let's see if I can, uh, here we go, let's see. So you've heard me talk about TMJ and that's how I started with my dad for 28 years. And I've only been doing the TMJ part for about 37 years now. Along the way, we came across something called airway. And uh, it was kind of a new concept at the time. And it was around when we formed the AAPMD. And you're gonna hear me talk about ortho. And of course, Ben is the expert in orthodontics. And a lot of us have taken his Invisalign courses and his other excellent courses with expansion. So I'm gonna talk about how we integrate TMJ, airway and orthodontics. And particularly people are interested in how to use a day appliance, how to use a night guard, and how is this integrated? We talk about this hidden path to wellness. It's not always so obvious how treating TMJ, airway, and ortho is really probably the most important aspect. And when we talk about diet, we talk about exercise, we talk about a good attitude. But airway, in fact, may be the most important of the pillars of health. And uh, we talk about treating the patient both during the day and at night. When people talk about sleep, it's primarily something that you do at night and it's something that you do when you take a nap. But when you start to talk about airway, airway is something that's with us 24 hours a day. And we, everyone talks a lot today about the autonomic nervous system, either fight and flight, the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic. And I think the work that Ben and I do uh, with Lauren is really a great way to get us more into the a balanced and more parasympathetic. You know, in the old days when I would go to the Equilibration Society, it was all about teeth. It was about equilibration. Occlusion was everything. And TMJ was really a very popular subject along with grinding, clenching, and there was no talk about the airway. 
today, when we talk about the pyramids, and it's really similar to the flipping of the food pyramid, we talk about airway trumps everything else in dentistry. And then after airway, we talk about TMJ, bruxing, grinding, clenching. Then we'll start to look at the occlusion. The last thing we really look at is the teeth. So I, I, I would send you back to August 2014 when we talk about this uh, TMD, the great controversy. Uh, Dan Jenkins put together this, this uh, issue and we had Jim Frickton, we had uh, uh, Prabhu Ramana Neuromuscular and we had Clifton Simmons. And what I talked about back then was the airway centric TMJ philosophy because I know coming from a father that really was a pioneer in TMJ, I can tell you that airway trumps TMJ just about every time. And I will tell you that most TMJ patients also have an airway problem. So here's a slide where we see a patient who's retronathic, their jaw is back, they're slipped off the disc. And when we slide the jaw forward and we open the airway, I think perhaps what happens at night and what we do by opening the airway will do more to alleviate and manage the TMJ problem than anything else we could have done you know, back in the day with B.B. McCollum and back in the day when centric relation was the rearmost, uppermost, the, the terminal hinge, as far back as you can go, if you go any further, the condyle would be in the ear. This was the accepted position in dentistry for about 75 years, at least from 1924, at least into the early 80s. And it was at that time that Peter Dawson said, you know what, the condyle really should be up against the eminence, anterior, superior. Now, Bill Farah in Montgomery, Alabama, and Harold Gelb in New York City, they were already bringing the jaw down and forward since the 60s. And it really was heresy at that time. And we have something called the Gelb 4-7. Whether you're gonna finish your ortho cases, your TMJ cases, your restorative cases in 4-7, in 1-4, in concentric, there, there's no one exact position for everyone. It's a range of where we're comfortable. So. This kind of shows you what would be an acceptable range. If you were looking to, where do you want to do an orthodontic case to? It's, it's usually a more anterior superior position because that's going to be where the patient's going to have an open airway. So most of the time you're going to, if you're taking a comb beam and I, and I really advocate the comb beam, you're going to see a more retruded jaw position, even more retruded than this. And then as you bring the jaw into a more centered position, more anterior superior position, not only is your aesthetics improved, the pain is reduced, the clicking is reduced, the snoring is alleviated, the patient wakes up more refreshed, and they wake up in a better mood. You know, these anatomical risk factors that we're talking about start at birth. And if you looked at this article in the European Journal of Pediatrics, the kids who died, the kids who died, and this is really before or along the time of SIDS, but the kids that died, they all had an infection, but they all had high narrow palates. They were all retronathic. They all had large tonsils and adenoids, deviated septum, and they all had a small upper airway. And their nasal maxillary complex was underdeveloped. It was insufficient for lack of use. And so when we talk about the horizontal growth that we're trying to attain, this is before, and this would be like an orthotropic case, for example, and that would be after. Now, this is my son. I never, you know, it just shows you, it go, it's in all of our families. I never understood why my son never smiled for 16, 17 years. And I know a lot, but I never really, I thought he was shy. What happened was he got his mother's teeth, of course. So, you know, Peg lateral, this has been bonded, short teeth. He was always a clencher and a grinder. This is after Lenny Cobrin uh, put on his laminates. And you really see what a maxilla. Now, of course, he should have had orthodontics with Ben. Um, and this would have been done more naturally. But he has tooth size discrepancy as well. You know, we don't see maxillas like the maxilla on the left. They don't come in like this we see more often a maxilla like the maxilla on the right. And it's really the 88% of all maxillas are retracted, retruded, too small. And it, I think that's exhibited pretty well by this. Ben and 
his teachings are trying to get that maxilla developed because not that will really solve and prevent most TMJ problems. So this is what we typically see. The tongue is down, the tongue is never up. And now uh, I have Jeremy with me in the office. We're looking at tongue tie. Uh, we're doing myofunctional therapy to try to get the proper restoral posture. So this is a TMJ case. The patient comes in, you can see the cant up to the left. You can see the dark circles under her eyes. She's got clicking and popping. The left joint is getting compressed. She's got a narrow maxilla. And after nine months, the dentist says to me, Michael, get rid of her airway problems, get rid of her TMJ problems, and just give me the correct bite. And so I set up the case as a TMJ practitioner. I set up the case. I get rid of the clicking, the popping, the pain, the neck aches. I work with a physical therapist. I level the planes. I get rid of the bags under the eyes. And then I refer to someone like Ben, or in this case, Dr. Ria Seco. This is what a day appliance would look like, ACG day. This is a schematic of a day appliance. It's a modified Gelb appliance. It provides cuspid guidance. There's acrylic behind the anterior teeth to avoid uh, intrusion. How do you take the bite? Everyone wants to know, how do you take the bite? How do you do it? Well, it's, I think it's fairly simple. Most of my patients, many of my patients come in with a symmetry, with a shift of the jaw. I try to put the chin back into the middle of the face. People, patients like that. I get rid of the clicking, the popping, the compression. And even if there's no click or pop, I take the pressure off the retrodiscal tissue. I use phonetics. I use like my dad did. I use 66, Mississippi, 66. Mississippi. Steve almost does a very similar thing. We try to put the jaw in something similar to a Gelb 4.7. It should improve facial aesthetics. It must open the airway. I like anterior guidance. And by the way, if I have an anterior open bite case, I always use a stabilization appliance, full coverage, and try to achieve cuspid guidance. So the teeth are the last thing we look at. We look at the airway first, then the TMJ. We're attempting to manage bruxism and we really help stabilize the cervical spine. The trigeminal nerve talks to the cervical nerves, to the, to the, there's an association. I always tell my patients, the jaw always, the jaw is good friends with the neck. So we must stabilize the jaw in order to help the physical therapist, the chiropractor, the osteopath, stabilize the cervical spine. My machine in the city, my, my VATEC goes down to C1 in the first rib. So I'm seeing many, many more scoliosis cases than ever before. We treat a lot of headache. And so when you see a patient like this, and it takes, it, this case took me about nine months. Most of the case take me about two to three months. You can see there are no bags under the eyes. We can, you can see we've leveled the arch. She feels about 10 to 15 years younger, even though it's nine months later. And this is the aesthetics that we get. The aesthetics comes for me from uh, restoring uh, uh, restorative sleep, getting increasing oxygenation, improving REM sleep, and stage three sleep. Most obstructions occur behind the maxilla and the mandible. That's why we're in this game. And I, I show every one of my patients gets, this, gets to look at this model. This shows you as the jaw goes back, the tongue goes back, the tongue is attached to the genial tubercles. As I bring the jaw forward, it opens the airway. I love Bill Hang's analogy. Your airway is either a coffee stirrer, a straw, or a garden hose. I try to bring the maxilla. With Ben's help, I bring the maxilla forward but for me, I'm setting the case up to open the airway. And so even the American College of Prosthodontics has recommended that before you make a night guard, and don't make a night guard that only opens vertical. That's what everyone's taught in dental school. That's what 90% of the practitioners out there are doing. They're making a night guard that actually puts the jaw in centric relation. It opens the jaw without protruding it. If you do that, 
you're going to get into trouble at least 50% of the time. I'm going to say you're going to aggravate the situation 90% of the time. This is an article by Gagnon. And if you look at this article, the HI was increased by more than 50% in half the patients. This article by Nicopolu, when they had the splint in, the HI went up to 17.4. That's with the splint in place. So be very careful about what kind of night guard you make. There is liability associated with it if you don't protrude the mandible at night. And now that you understand this, we're trying to get dentists to see this, that if you're building your cases in terminal hinge, like this appliance, you're making a big mistake. And this just shows you, if you read this article, this shows you how when you do the right thing with a guard, with a day plate, with a night guard, you actually help stabilize the cervical spine. I love to talk about aesthetics. I love restoring lower third face height. And I think, Ben, we're probably most successful in our cases that have lost lower third face height. Not people like me with long faces, but people that have short lower thirds. We restore the lips. We open the eyes. We change the tone of the skin. This is a day appliance. This is our FAR, our ACG night. Remember, the standard night guard does prevent you from wearing down your teeth. It does prevent fractured restorations, but there's at least a 50% chance that you're closing the airway with your guard that you're using right now. What we look for are the airway promises. These are the promises. What if I could tell you that if you used a guard like this, I think Jameson Spencer calls it a anterior guidance splint. What if you told your patients, you know, you could wake up refreshed. You could wake up in a better mood. We could get rid of your clicking, your popping, your locking. You could wake up and have no headache. We can get rid of your snoring. We can manage your clenching. We can actually open your airway and we can improve heart rate variability. So these are some of the reasons why we do these splints. Some of it's orthopedic, some of it's surgical. Certainly we open the airway. We hope to reduce bruxism. We decrease inflammation and hopefully it'll give you a better memory. We improve focus and concentration in kids and adults. We take the hands off of your neck so you're not being choked. We get rid of anxiety. You wake up refreshed. We help with reflux and we help with psychological well being. This is an example of the ACG Knight. It comes with a lower S6, or you can wear it with a lower Invisalign tray. And this is how we take a patient who's tired, red eyes, exhausted, she's in pain. And what we see is that it takes about two to three months to transform the skin, the eyes. We also accessorize with earrings in our practice. And this is the case. Ben, this is someone who needed to see you. She's bone on bone, by the way, in the TM joint. She is bone on bone. Not a good way to finish a case. She's actually bone on bone with an anterior osteophyte on both uh, subchondral cyst, flattening. And she needs you, Ben. This is a case that uh, would be perfect for you. So I set up the case with my day appliance, my night appliance. I make her feel much better. And it's all through this airway philosophy. Now, we do use physical therapy and Botox. So as part of our treatment, we treat the muscles. So we treat someone like this that it has huge jaw muscles. And with a, in about three months, by using appliance therapy, physical therapy, and Botox therapy, we alleviate the pain. So prosthodontists and general dentists should screen patients for sleep apnea during the treatment planning stages, before you do the crowns, before the ortho. And by the way, the aesthetics is nothing short of, I think, miraculous. The reason that we can get these results is that we treat the TMJ, but the treatment of the TMJ is just a gateway for the airway and the orthodontics. The orthodontics is really the final solution, growing the airway, which is what Dr. Moralia loves to talk about. 
this is what gives you the oxygenation and the deep restorative sleep. And if you give a woman, if you give a perimenopausal woman back her airway, if you give her back her restorative sleep and you give her back oxygenation, the body responds very well. So I think I'm gonna stop there. I've had my 15 minutes of fame and uh, I'm gonna throw it back to uh, you, Ben. Oh yeah, thank you, Michael. That was amazing. I mean, I, I've, I've known you a long time and I've seen a lot of your work, but every time I see it, uh, just totally blown away. And I gotta go back, I need to go back to my office and practice and get better after seeing <laughs> all that. I need more practice. Thank you. <laughs> well, and just on the note of how, you know, you're doing that acute uh, TMD screening and treatment, we, I have a patient to share. So we'll, I'll bring up a, a young man that we, we got to collaborate on let me get this uh, title slide. Did I get the title slide up for everybody to see? Yeah, we're there. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, there we are. That, yep, that was me before teenagers. I was young and healthy at one point. And so well, then the teenagers will age you a little bit. Now, let's see here. So Just to this say, one, Dr. Ben, that was, that was two weeks ago, my visit with you. So you're looking pretty good. Oh, that was two weeks ago? <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking that's like 10 years ago. Yeah, you must be going through expansion. I'm going backwards. <laughs> All right. So... This is a uh, nice young man that uh, Dr. Gelb had seen first. And so the, the short history is that he, he does have uh, orthodontics, but he had them in a retractive technique. And so with the retraction in the maxillary arch, the lower arch is trapped behind it. And so I, I like to describe how sometimes the maxilla could be the criminal and the mandible could be the victim. And so if the upper jaw isn't grown wider and forward, then the mandible doesn't really have a good place to land. And so the mandible is the moving piece, and it can only land appropriately if the upper jaw is grown beautifully. If we have a lack of development and or retractive techniques, we can put an upper jaw and teeth in a position where the lower gets trapped behind it. And if the lower jaw gets trapped behind it, we get that posterior displacement. And just like Dr. Gelb was explaining, if that disc, if the condyle is going back, the disc is coming forward, and that's where he ends up. So when we first meet him, he's, he's not you know happy or healthy at the time, but He's had um, stabilization with, with Dr. Gelb, and you're gonna recognize with the appliance that he comes in wearing at some point. But we start out, I start out here just to kind of show a picture of a nice arch form because you know braces can line up teeth, but if you have braces and or headgear and or elastics, and they've served to try to keep that maxillary arch trapped back a little bit, then the lower arch might be a victim of where the upper arch is. So while this photograph shows someone who's um, narrow, believe it or not, by measurement, because here we would measure this at 34 millimeters. And I, I'm a big fan of the transpalatal or transverse measurement. This, there's 34 millimeters between his upper molars and a, a good arch starts at 40. And so a minimum would be 40 millimeters apart to have a really wide position. But there are uh, photos and information where we could look at to show where he's in a retracted position. And you know, the anterior photograph a moment ago didn't really show lip display. So when we're thinking about where we are here, uh, that retracted position drops the lower, drops the upper lip down, and we don't really get an upper lip display showing. We go to the profile view, and it turns out the upper lip is actually backwards. So here we have someone who had been retracted enough to basically drop the lip into a position where we don't really see much, and basically now the eyes and lips are all lined up in one plane, and then it gets us to a chief complaint list. And so this this patient ends up uh, three years in braces, then the uh, the jaw pain and discomfort come, and this is the list we get from Dr. Gelb, clenching, jaw locking, ear pain, cracking and shooting pain. And then the quotes are clicking my jaw, which means when he's opening and he starts to feel the click, that sends a shooting pain from the left side of his jaw to his ear. But his, his biggest issue is his back teeth don't touch. And so when, when we meet him and we take a picture like this, this is him putting his teeth behind where we would like to have a little overbite overjet, but when he starts to squeeze to try to get the back teeth together, he's in agony. And so the more he tries to force that together, the further back the condyle goes, the more the disc becomes displaced anteriorly and the more uncomfortable he gets. And so he can't really get his back teeth together. And this is a strained and uncomfortable position. So what we learn, what we learned from Dr. Gelb is that he had significant muscle groups in moderate to severe tenderness. And so, you know, here he starts out with a significant amount of inflammation, a significant amount of discomfort, and it becomes a daily basis. And so it can be a quality of life issue for some people. Now, 
in, in my world, I try to think about treating symptoms versus treating cause. And so if I'm thinking about the TMD patient, I'm trying for development and the key tends to be the maxillary arch. So I, I like to develop the upper arch. And if I could develop the upper arch, it frees that lower arch to you know, land in a better place. And so basically like Dr. Gelb was saying, it's really not about the teeth, it's about the foundation and getting the foundation into a, a better place can help someone to uh, you know, be kind of permanently removed from all their symptoms. And so when, when, we, when we meet them, there's that appliance. You might recognize this, Michael. I do. I'm very yeah. familiar. And so, you know, this right here is what you were just talking about. And this is the spot where you got him. And, you know, I just forget how many weeks or months it might have been, but you basically got him into relief. And so knowing that you have him in relief at this point was when you sent him over and said, you know, this is a good place and you're comfortable. But, you know, now that we've got your, you know, jaws freed up and your your bite doesn't match, your teeth don't match, you should go maybe talk to Dr. Morelli and see if there's an opportunity to move some stuff around. So after you got him stable and he did have um, disc displacement, you had to recapture stuff for him. You had a whole bunch to do. So you got him comfortable. He came in for consultation and we got to this. So the, the whole key for me was really that maxillary development because if I want to free up that mandible, I need to move the teeth. And so what we're looking at is a difference from about um, 34 to 39. So we give them a lot of expansion. We procline or push the front teeth forward and that opens up spaces. So you start recognizing he's got a millimeter of space between all those laterals and they're undersized. They, like you mentioned with your son, a tooth size discrepancy. You know, yeah. it's more common than not. You know, it's, a lot of people have these deficient laterals. And in, um, in some of the studies, it shows that the humans have a deficient lateral about 70% of the time which it makes it difficult to have uh, an orthodontic technique that involves space closure because then automatically the upper is retracted too much thanks to the laterals being deficient in most patients and the lower is trapped. So we, we should start to account for that discrepancy and open up spaces. Spacing is not unhealthy. And so I think, you know, for a long time we got trapped into, oh, nobody wants to see a space. Well, you know, nobody wants a TMD problem and nobody wants an airway problem. And if we can restore a little bit of space, how easy is it to make a veneer or some composite? The spacing becomes the least of the issues when you think about having better TMD and airway and sleeping from all that. So if we could get him from, you know, 34 all the way up to a 39 millimeter width and procline those front teeth, what it does is it opens up an opportunity for the lower to close in a forward position. And so what we're looking at on the right side is him being able to close with total comfort. And so the widening and the proclining of that upper gives the lower a landing spot where when we start to talk about how he feels his teeth coming together, he recognizes at this point that only his back teeth touch. So going from, I can't get my back teeth together and I'm in agony trying to, I can close, my back teeth hit, they hit equally, they hit first, and I don't, I barely notice my front teeth hitting now. So that is combined with complete comfort. So he ends up being completely asymptomatic as far as the, the TMD symptoms. Um, he just wears a, a Vivera retainer. You know, Invisalign makes retainers, but any clear retainer at night would be good. And since the time of you know, opening up that upper arch and being able to have the lower land in a more anterior position for him, better condyle, better disc, better musculature, the forward position delivers a bigger airway, better breathing, better sleeping. The whole thing goes you know, into falls into place for him and he becomes asymptomatic, splint free and medication free was for him some an, basically anti-inflammatories. Every now and then he found himself taking anti-inflammatories to help control his symptoms. But once, once you get a, a nice um, arrangement of maxillary, mandibular, teeth, occlusion, if you do fill in the puzzle, starting with TMD, airway, et cetera, right down the line, you could deliver a really happy, healthy patient in the end. And, you know, We've been able to collaborate now, I think since back in 2012 or 13, where we had an opportunity uh, to do a bunch of cases in, in your Manhattan office and then yes. um, your referrals from, you know, the, the part people might not know is that we, we only work about 20 minutes from each other. Right. And so we've had the opportunity to collaborate on a number of patients in both directions. You know, I meet people who need you first, and then uh, I get people sent to me after you've got them stabilized and they're ready for some wider and forward ortho hey, orthopedics or orthodox. Ben, we had a question. Did you do anything on the lower arch? Did you do any uprighting of the lower arch uh, yes. at all, or was it only the upper arch? 
It is lower uprighting as well. Yeah, because if we're going to take that upper out to 39 millimeters and the toe and the forward teeth, you know, as well, the procline, the lower's got to upright. So the, the lower teeth get uprighting. Yeah, can yes. you show that repositioning slide, the, the one that says repositioning splint, one, one back. Yeah, right there. So you see on the left, you see the, yeah. the, the drop down bend and the curve there on that lower arch. That, can yeah. you talk a little bit about why those teeth are so much in the basement, those posterior teeth, I want, you know, oh, yeah. I, want, I want, yeah, you talk about making the upper wide enough, Ben, you say you have to make the upper wide enough so that you can upright those lowers, correct? Yes, in fact, most of the people that you and I recognize in that TMD airway sleep disorder breathing, those comorbidities, most of them have collapse or excess lingual inclination. So they show up being narrow and vaulted and the teeth are a symptom of that, but the teeth end up collapsed in. So when you're working on you know, foundation first and then followed by teeth second in the lower, you tend to need a lot of uprighting. The bottom teeth tend to kind of lean right in. And not only do they lean in, but they compromise that amount of tongue space. So while the tongue does live in the palate, 34 millimeters isn't enough you know, size for a tongue to fit in there. And you know, the only time you don't see the lower inclination as excessive is the patient who's got the bilateral crossbite. You know, the, that interesting look in where you've got a bilateral posterior crossbite, it tends to be that the lower is perfect. It's got the full upright position, a monster space, and there's no upper jaw. So when you develop that upper jaw all the way out over the lower, you're in a good spot. You know, that patient I described, what we don't want to do is take the lower and force it underneath the upper. When you have a crossbite in the back, the idea is not to take the lower and force it under, get the top going over. So maxillary development is the key. And basically it leads the way. So as we start to develop the maxilla, the lower follows it. So, you know, it's kind of like a shoebox. You've got the top and the bottom and you really want to have the top be fully developed and then you can have the bottom follow it. So make the, yeah. maxillary, make the maxillary arch the leader. Ben, let me ask you a question here too. You see the wear of the anterior teeth. You see how that left central has been worn. So you and yeah. I have talked over the years, we talk a lot about how the patient comes into protrusive all the time and they wear out the incisal edge. You see, oh, a, yeah. lot of, you see a lot of incisal wear. Uh, if you put on your restorative cap, and I know we have people like Scott on the line and uh, you know on the, on the uh, uh, call tonight, would you end up restoring some incisal length or would, would you try to do that orthodontically, restore the incisal, uh, uh, this, the height of the tooth? Yeah, most, most of the work is done orthodontically. If we're gonna move teeth like this, we'll get them nice and level. But once we've got that full posterior beautiful occlusion and upright teeth with vertical load, you know, those edges, if it's small, a little polish, I don't mind. If it's okay. a little excessive, then a little composite. We can do composites along the edges as well. Um, this happens to be a patient where we never did a single restorative thing for him. And he's already about five years post-treatment. Even the lateral space, when we got to the end, even though he has that lateral space, he was so happy and comfortable that, you know, I had asked him year after year after year, do you want me to put veneers over there? Do you want a couple of bondings in the space? He never even looked or cared about that little space. He was just happy not to have the pain anymore and not to be, you know, to be able to chew food and get his back teeth together and have all that good stuff. That's to this great. day, we, we, yeah, no bonding there. So the, um, the comfort level tends to, you know, exceed the aesthetics, but we're happy to do the aesthetics also. No, it's a great case. That's fat. It's a fabulous. And he was case. young. Now you point out that the wear and tear, but he's a 20 year old, you know, look at the damage by 20, just having that, you know, retraction and trapped jaw. Basically his lower jaw is fighting to get out the whole time. And it's, it's fighting because of the breathing and it's fighting to move forward and be out of the way. And you know now, what I never thought of in the past, but because we're paying attention to it now, how many people tell you that they feel like their tongue has no room and they feel like their lower jaw's back and they, they feel better when they put their lower jaw forward and their teeth in front. And so when you start talking and asking and listening to the patients, they'll tell you that they're trapped. The lower is too tight. There's no room for the tongue. Their teeth don't fit. They're, they'll say things, and then you start knowing, like, okay, I got to open them up and give them some freedom. Yeah, Ben, I love the way you fix the uh, cant. I love the way you level the occlusion of the maxilla. You brought that whole left side down so that everything was parallel to the horizon. I think that was uh, it's a fa fabulous result. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's one of many. I think to this point, you and I have probably collaborated on maybe fifty or sixty cases like this between, you know, New York City and, and uh, Mount Kisco, where I am. Hey, Ben, and, 
Can you, yeah, good stuff. Can you, can you make a comment um, for the people out there that are wondering if they should jump right into Invisalign or should they attempt to control the clicking, the popping, the headaches, the neck pain? Should they, should they attempt to control the TMJ symptoms first? Or do you think- Yeah, so it, yeah, it, 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 there's only a, on the rare side of things where someone has mild symptoms, can I get involved with a, an orthopedic or orthodontic approach immediately? But anything that would be considered moderate or severe, you should be seeing you first or someone like you. Is I don't I don't really do TMD stabilization at all. I make the referral because I have you that I can send to and I know it's going to be awesome. So yeah, most of the patients are in those moderate severe categories need some time with you first. Stabilize them. Then once they're comfortable and ready and the disc has been recaptured and the inflammation's gone and the pain is gone and like you said, they have comfort again. Now they're sleeping better already and then we can start to take over. But in the very mild category, I could jump in and do some work. There was a question from Dr. Province. Um, what is your recommendation for us GPs that have many vertical bite splints out there? Should we have them take a HST and then replace their splints with the anterior repositioning splint? That's a great question. So, you know, I think the FARA, the ACG Knight, or that, that appliance, the upper that Ben showed you and that I showed, that's going to be Night Guard 2.0, Scott. That to me is the new Night Guard. And uh, I was speaking to one of the dentists I had taught, and he said, if anyone comes in with discomfort, he's wearing a Farah, his wife's wearing a Farah, everyone in the office is wearing a Farah. This is, to me, the new night guard. This is a night guard that doesn't just open vertical and close the airway and push the jaw back. This allows a degree of protrusion, which is what the American College of Prosthodontics recommends, so if I see condyles that are compressed, especially, and if I see a narrowed airway, if I think that they're snoring and sleep apnea, I will almost always get a sleep test. But if someone comes in, like Ben said, and they're acute, they're in a lot of pain, they're clicking, they're popping, they're locking, I might spend the first six to eight weeks getting rid of the clicking, the pain, uh, you know, they're in such acute pain that I'm going to get them out of pain first. And that can take me four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Now they're wearing the appliance and they say, how do you feel? They go, well, my jaw feels great, but you know, I'm still snoring and I'm still exhausted. I'm not refreshed. Oh, okay. You see, I don't have any ability with this splint. I love the splint, but I have no ability, Scott, to be able to advance to titrate. Right, Ben? So if I need to bring them another millimeter forward to it, it take, I'm not going to keep adding acrylic. So I'll go to a prosomnus, I'll go to an upper or lower, I'll go to something that allows me a degree of titratability. And then I can treat to the symptoms I treat to the sleep test. And then I'll send it to Ben because Ben's going to allow them to be able to, he's going to grow the airway permanently. So the trend, what Dr. Moralia said is that I'm really the setup guy. He's really permanently changing the structure. If you believe what Daniel Lieberman said, if you believe what Coricini said, if you believe what Weston Price said, if you believe what James Nestor said, then you have to, you have to follow what Ben Moralia is saying and grow the airway in many, many, many. Are you gonna have an, a patient wear an appliance in the next 60? This kid was young, right, Ben? This kid was in his 20s, 20. early 20. Yeah, 20, college kid, 20 years old, you know? He's not, he doesn't wanna wear a device the rest of his life. So the, the real, the, the where we're going, Scott, with this is that in a lot of cases, we really wanna develop that airway with that, whichever technique you wanna use you want to follow Ben's advice and develop that airway so they don't have to wear one of our devices the rest of their life. Does the nighttime repositioning splint have a negative effect if worn over a long period of time, like a MAD, such as silent night? It can, and Ben can talk to this too. I mean, the long-term effects is that it can pull back the maxilla a little bit uh, and it can, those lower anterior teeth, that's why we have an appliance. So if you can do a technique like Ben's got the patient in Vivera retainers, which if you, you know, what they've shown in a lot of studies is that you'll cut the apnea hypopnea index by 50% and 
by just these expansion appliances alone. So Ben, what do you, what do you think about that, that question? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, it was Dr. Markland published this study. And I think that publication was 2016. And what they did was they followed the, um, for a decade, they looked at patients who had a MED or a mandibular advancement device for more than a decade. And it showed that their OSA credentials were worse 10 years later and with the appliance in. In other words, they had their original uh, sleep study. They had their OSA diagnosis. They made a MED and there was an improvement. So short-term improvement, because you are holding the jaw forward, you got the tongue coming forward, the repositioning, titrated, we're good. But over time, what starts to happen is there's an anterior bite change. And so when you notice that anterior bite change, it is a rotation of the maxilla backwards. And so uh, a mandibular advancement device, if it has, if it's given enough strength over a long period of time, it can induce the rotational change in the maxilla. The maxillary sutures can be remodeled uh, for the first seven decades of life. So one of the first signs is gonna be a change in the anterior bite. And it's not that the lower jaw is being yanked forward, it's held forward, but we're, we're thinking about Newton's third law, equal and opposite. So holding the lower forward is pulling the upper back. And the pulling the upper back over an extended period of time can cause remodeling. But when the upper jaw is rotating back, it starts to close off the airway slowly, which is why 10 years later, they showed patients with the mandibular repositioning or anterior mandibular advancement devices having OSA worse with the appliance in. So no matter how far you held the tongue forward, the OSA was going to be worse if you had maxillary remodeling. So um, I, I, I don't use those because I prefer to develop the maxilla. And so my goal is always the orthopedic approach to maxillary development, followed by tooth coordination. So even in my world, the teeth are dead last. We want to get that you know, patient sleeping and breathing and TMD sound. And next thing you know, maxillary development, tooth coordination, and you could have all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, I would prefer not to have patients land in Markland's study, but it's out there that you're basically your mandibular advancement device has a possibility of acting like a headgear device with maxillary retraction over a long period of time. Ben, quickly, there's a question on what is the best way to expand the maxilla in adults? You want to give the short answer on that? <laughs> Yeah, the short answer is removable, uh, uh, removable appliances in adults. So uh, because you do have the first seven decades to play with the maxillary sutures and you can cause them to remodel given a good technique, you just need it to be in the removable category to do it naturally. Uh, if you wanna be in the fixed category, you're probably heading into some sort of surgical facilitation of a fixed uh, expansion appliance, but a removable device with an appropriate technique can grow a patient's maxilla of almost any age. And Dr. Knight has a question for Dr. Gelb. If patient is stabilized with prosomnus and going into expansive ortho, do you need to do anything while going through Invisalign expansion to keep airway open? Do patients tend to become symptomatic again without the prosomnus until they get expansion? That's a fantastic question. And uh, you know, once you've shown the patient a little bit of Nirvana, once they've been to Paris, I always say it's hard to come back to the farm, you know, in the Midwest. So Ben and I have had this. We've had one patient, remember Ben, you know, with the Oasis. Yes. So, you know, it's always difficult because we want to keep the jaw forward at night. <laughs> so some people end up going on CPAP for the year that it takes or whatever time it takes that they can go on CPAP. There are these overlay appliances that are made by different labs like uh, Space Maintainer Labs has come up with a, a device. Sometimes we'll use like a Myo Research Ben you know, a uh, upper and lower that keeps the jaw forward at night. But, you know, we're, we, Ben, you and I have discussed this for years and we're yeah. looking now, Invisalign does put attachments. And if you take some of the advanced courses with Dr. Moralia, there are some things that you can do with Invisalign um, and with these other techniques to hold the mandible forward at night so that you can maintain the patency of the airway while you're expanding that maxilla. Oh yeah, and in some simple cases, we actually just inserted like a class two elastic just to kind of support the mandible position forward while we were doing all of the techniques we'd like to do. And in more advanced crazy ones where the one you brought up, I remember we, we were working underneath an oasis kind of thing. And oh my God. We, hollow, we hollowed it out. We were doing Invisalign under oasis because that worked really well to maintain the airway and the breathing. Uh, and that's a chore and a half, but you know, Part of dentistry is being creative, thinking outside the box, you know, be a problem solver, you know, just because 
it just because you know you don't see it's one and one equals two maybe it's going to have all kinds of complications or more you know just be more creative think about it and figure it out how can i get through and like you mentioned in some cases it means let's let's get a cpap back on for the year because it's too complicated to work underneath appliances and you know for someone to wear a cpap for 12 months or 18 months while you're progressing and getting better and better and better, knowing that they could get off it at the end, that's not a bad trade-off sometimes. So it's, you know, individual patients, you work out the problems and be a problem solver and be creative. It's okay, there's not one formula for everybody. Dr. Province has another great question for Dr. Gelb. I'm on board with expansion. Uh, hold on, it was just covered up by someone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> It's just um, hovering there. I'm on board with expansion and doing it, but not all who have a guard will go forward. And since, since long-term wear of the repositioning splint can be harmful. So what do we do? It's a tough place for us to know, to be knowing we are not helping with the vertical bite splint as much as we thought. Can you just say that a little slower that the second, sure. the, the first two lines of that question? Yep, I'm on board with expansion and doing it, but not all who have a guard will go forward. And since long-term wear of the repositioning splint can be harmful, what do we do? It's a tough place for us to be knowing that we're not helping with the vertical bite splint as much as we thought. Yeah, so I think, you know, if you start to um, take some comb beams and I'd look, uh, Scott, I'd love, I, I want every, I'd love everyone to be able to have a comb beam. I don't think I'd want to practice dentistry now if I didn't have my comb beam. So now I'm visualizing the airway on every case. I'm looking at the condyles. I give out home sleep tests from my practice. So in the cases where, look, I used, uh, I used these mandibular like prosomnus devices. I've used them for 30 years. Now that I'm finally getting, now that I'm finally understanding things a little bit, we're sending many, many more people to people like Ben Moralia, and Ben sent me Jeremy Montrose in my office. So we're doing a lot more myofunctional. We're doing a lot more of different types of these expansion splints. And people, they're coming to me, they're reading the book Breath by James Nestor. They're reading Sleep Interrupted by Steve Park. They're reading, Get, they understand that it's really about getting to the root cause. And when Ben talks about getting, Look, I'm not, I'm not, I don't take any, uh, I'm not going to apologize for using repositioning splints. I'm the setup guy. You know, I'm going to get you to the sixth inning, okay? And then you're, Ben's going to close it out. But he's Mariano Rivera. But I'm not upset that I got rid of someone's pain that they've had their whole life. Look, I'm, I'm the last resort guy. But now I got a guy beyond me. I got Ben Moralia. I got Jeremy Montrose. They're really going to fix this problem, hopefully permanently. So, Scott, it's a transition in our thinking, and you don't have to be everything. So I've done great with these splints. I thought I was transforming people's lives until I met Ben, and then until I met people that are doing expansion and growing the airway permanently. Now I know that there's even a – it's so great because I can just do what I do best, what I'd love to do. And then I can work with Ben and Jeremy and people like that, that can permanently fix the situation. So you just- and I can add. Yeah, what else, Ben? Yeah. Oh, I can add a little too, because I don't, I don't get to treat 100% of the people that I want to treat with growth and development. And so, you know, there, there are patients who like, um, if you have, any patients in the practice, let's say, that might have just a traditional night guard that is flat and maybe opening them only, and you're thinking maybe that's, then one small step would be to upgrade towards something like this. You know, the appliances Dr. Gelb showed that have anterior repositioning as well. You have open plus forward. All of a sudden, you've made an improvement. So you, you can graduate to, let's say, a better night guard and then have something that's, you know, uh, supportive of better breathing and better position of the lower jaw and the tongue, because yeah, that does exist where not every patient says, yeah, let me go through all of that. Some are willing to go through the treatment and others aren't, but you could take a baby step and that baby step would be, let's make a different kind of night guard that has a better, more anterior position. That's one. Like Michael said, introduce myofunctional therapy. Uh, take a look at the frenum for revision. Get some nasal hygiene going, a little better nose breathing. You know, you just incorporate little things along the way. And next thing you know, your patient will feel a little better about some stuff. And who knows, you might have planted the seeds that grow so that a year or two later, they decide, well, let me go for that expansive orthodontic technique you were talking about. But at least you can make small changes in multiple different areas that are smaller steps that patients are willing to take. And you gradually win them more. 
Of course, you don't have to worry that, oh my God, I have, I've made uh, 50 night guards this year and they're all flat and now I'm worried. Slowly, you can introduce that, well, with research and growth, and, you know, we learn more and we have a slightly better design in our night guards. We'd like to upgrade yours. It's like trading your car for a new version. That's all. So you can, you can go about it that way. Great answer. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Gelb, what does a myofunctional therapist working with an acute DMD patient or um, a patient on a TMD appliance need to be mindful of during their treatment? One of the things that's come to mind is that if you have a tight frenum, they say that the tongue is the top, is the, the uppermost part of the fascial chain. So it, a lot of our tightness in our neck and our tightness throughout our body really starts with the tongue. So if I'm trying to treat acute TMJ and I'm not addressing either with a physical therapist, a myofunctional therapist, a speech language pathologist, a DO, if I'm not stretching out those tissues, those pharyngeal tissues, and I'm not working on that, uh, I'm probably not going to get permanent success with my cervical muscles, sternocleidomastoids, trapezius, posterior. So it's part of the treatment, both with what Ben does, both with growing the airway and having the tongue being the scaffolding, having the tongue being the permanent retainer to keep the width of that maxilla long term. And Guimanol showed this in many of his studies that you see relapse in the patients that have had tonsils, adenotonsillectomy and expansion. If you don't do the myofunctional, the case can relapse. So I think that looking at the tongue and starting to implement myofunctional. My mother, by the way, was a myofunctional therapist. And my daughter now is becoming a speech language pathologist to treat this. So I think it's really coming to light that we really, in many, many cases, we really wanna use someone, a myofunctional therapist, uh, to just augment both our TMJ, uh, acute pain results, but also to augment our airway and our, our sleep and breathing. How does one know how far to expand for TMJ? Well, you know, I'll answer, I'll let Ben answer after me, but you know, what I learned from Ben and I, what I learned from Barry, I really want to make the palate wide enough to, to hold the tongue. In other words, if I've got a large car, the garage has to be wider than my car. And so I want the maxilla to be wide. And you know, I see all these people that had palate expanders and I still can't see, they still have no buckle. They're not wide enough. What Ben said was brilliant. It's gotta be around 38, 40, 42 millimeters, depending on the size of the arch. So, you know, orthodontists have done this thing called palate expansion, but they had no idea how wide to make the palate. You still have a very sick patient and they don't even look good. So you really have to expand to grow the airway and you have to grow the airway as much as you can. And Ben, and ben said it you have to get them to be nasal breathers. So a lot of the techniques that Dr. Moralia is doing, he's expanding the palate and hopefully at the same time, not only making room for the tongue, but also hopefully opening up the nasal aperture, improving the nasal airway at the same time. Yeah, that's always the goal. And in fact, the nasal breathing is at the top of the list. So you know, restoring nasal breathing without resistance is a top priority. And and the tongue becomes number two. You really need to have the space for the tongue. And in, in the numbers that you were mentioning, yeah, the, if we're thinking about how far to expand, you know, the, a, a minimum, the minimum target would be having 40 millimeters between three and 14. So when you're thinking about the upper first molars, 40 millimeters between them is a minimum. And when you go back and you take a look at that nice anthropology research from Corcini and Price and all the other ones involved, they show that you know, prior to the industrial Western lifestyle where the jaws grew fully, you know, they would find minimums at 45 and 50. And so the range was 45 to 55 in human beings and 45 being the lowest, but that accounts for all 32 teeth. You know, a fully developed human being has 32 teeth in there. So if we're gonna talk about the jaws being fully grown, well, you've gotta have all 32 teeth and you really need 40 millimeters at minimum between uh, three and 14. At a 40 millimeter mark, you get to keep most of the wisdom teeth. But if you're looking for 100% wisdom tooth eruption and retention into function, uh, you got to go back 500 years ago before any type of real change in industrial Western softer diets and have you know people at 45 to 50 millimeters between there. So we're going to be, when you start measuring that and you realize adults are 28 and 30 and 32, 
and your tongue has lost eight and 10 and 12 millimeters of space, you know, the arches end up being like a compactor and the only place the tongue could go is posterior. So the tongue is basically getting squeezed down the throat and that it interferes with all the airflow. So yeah, 40 is like a minimum target. And if you can get the kids earlier, it's a lot easier in kids to get them all the way out into the 40 and 45 range and then erupt the wisdom teeth. In the adults, you know, wherever you're starting, you, do, you need to build the right size garage for that car. And so like Michael was given that analogy. It's so funny because we, we have some of the same analogies, which is so great. But I like to refer to the tongue as the body's Ferrari. And so if your body has a Ferrari, it's the tongue. But the, anybody who had a Ferrari would have a garage that is way bigger than that car because the last thing you want to do is ding the sides of it up. You're going to build a garage for your Ferrari. It's going to be bigger. Well, your maxilla should be that Ferrari's garage. So you're, you're looking to go until you have a patient who is breathing beautifully through the nose with no resistance, has no TMD symptoms, has a full night's sleep that's rested. When you start checking off the boxes for healthy, then you know you've gone far enough. If you expanded six millimeters or eight millimeters, but your patient still had symptoms, you would know you hadn't done enough. Wider and forward until the patient is asymptomatic, healthy with nasal breathing and no, no checklist of symptoms that are still going on. For some patients, that is 45. That's great. One of the best things, Scott, one of the best things I've done in the last year since I've been with Jeremy is I'm doing exactly that. I'm measuring the molar to molar width now in every patient on my CBCT. And it's just a great, it's just a great guide that I know that they've got to be wider. And so if I'm not getting success with my devices, I have to go to the ortho next. And really, I have to get that width. Terrific. And I know we have a lot of questions tonight, so we're going to have to have you come back, Dr. Gelb. I hope you can join us another time uh, to talk about this because it's such a hot topic. But perhaps you can ask one question that wasn't um, covered would be TMJ treatment options for pediatric patients. You know, when I have a kid, I really am trying to get them to Ben as soon as possible because, you know, I've heard Ben lecture so many times and he, he uses these guided growth appliances so nicely and he, he shows such beautiful, I don't want to waste time, even for six weeks. The only time I would treat a kid, maybe if their jaw was locked or maybe if they had severe headaches, but I'm really, I don't want to waste the time. I want to get them to Ben let Ben do everything with the myofunctional and these myofunctional guided growth appliances. Let him start at two and a half, three, three and a half. Do you agree, Ben? I, I want to get him to you. Oh, yeah, I can. definitely. You can, you can get into the removable appliances. Certainly, again, the frenum revision if needed, the myofunctional therapy, or a, a lot of times with the kids who show up with TMD or TMJ, TMD symptoms, uh, we go right to expanders because maxillary development solves that in a short order. And so the child who comes in with some TMD symptoms, we get right into the upper expander, open up the maxillary arch, and the TMD dissolves within sometimes days, if not weeks, and it's gone permanently. So it's maxillary development that really gives the, uh, the child relief. We get involved immediately. Terrific. Well, we have about two minutes left, so I just wanted to um, thank you both so much. Thank you, Dr. Gelb. Thank you, Dr. Moralia, for all of your wisdom. I know you helped a lot of people connect the dots today on the connection with TMD and Airway, and this will be recorded so everyone can listen to this a couple of times to really digest the information. But we have some exciting uh, conversations coming up. Next week, we have Dr. Stacey um, Ochoa talking about the benefits of vitamin D. And then there were a lot of questions this evening about um, perio you know, uh, issues with expansion. So we're gonna cover a whole hour on that on uh, April 21st with Dr. Ben to return. Uh, Professor John Yu will be joining us April 30th. We're really excited about that um, at noon. It's a Friday, it's not a Wednesday evening due to the time difference in the, in the UK. And Dr. Lauren Ballinger, um, she actually, uh, Dr. Moralia mentored her in the beginning and now she's a pediatric dentist who just practices airway all day, every day. And she's making great strides with collaborative care. And we have Dr. Richard Downs and he will be telling us about implementing sleep medicine into your airway practice. So stay tuned for that. I think we're gonna take the summer off, <laughs> maybe July and August to enjoy <laughs> those, uh, those long evenings, but probably not. We'll probably have some other things pop up. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we do have a clear aligner case review course, um, which I find it's more like a workshop. We had our first one uh, a couple of weeks ago and we really got great feedback. So you can kind of see 
uh, through the, the ClinCheck developments, we're gonna be reviewing Invisalign cases, how expansion techniques are implemented. So feel free to join us either as an auditor or as a case submitter. Our case submitter spots are really limited. So we encourage you to register soon if you wanna have your um, aligner case reviewed by Dr. Ben. If you wanna learn how Dr. Ben does all of this expansion, there's really no shortcuts. We can give you all these conversations, but you really need to dive in, roll up your sleeves and take our mini residency to learn the techniques behind this. We do have a couple of spots open for Friday if you're interested for our pediatric mini residency. And then we have our adult mini residency in a couple of weeks, April 23rd. So we do offer them monthly uh, to be convenient. You can mix and match the dates uh, with the exception of August and December. We now offer a myofunctional therapy course for the hygienist. It's specifically for the hygienist to integrate myofunctional therapy into your dental practice. So that's kind of what sets us apart. It's a two day online course that runs um, concurrently with our mini residency and our instructors are Brittany Sierra who was actually featured on James Nestor's podcast and Carice Laguerre who is also a published author. Um, Please follow us on social media. We have a lot of tidbits and information and resources for you, um, as well as my blog. I'm actually going through expansion therapy. So I made this patient friendly on purpose. It's a great educational tool for your patients to use. Uh, we have our airway dentist map. So once you take our mini residency, you get to become on our dentist, airway dentist locator. So this is helpful in many ways. Uh, to be a referral source, but also for other doctors in this community to find doctors, uh, dentists for their loved ones or patients perhaps who are moving to other areas. So here's our contact information. Dr. Gelb, can you tell us um, a little bit about the exciting the AAPMD meeting that's coming up in September? A little bit more info on that. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be down in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Omni Hotel, September 23rd to 26th. And we'll be there with AOSH combined with AAPMD, uh, Barry Raphael and Ben. There's going to be a lot of great orthodontic uh, information. I don't know if I'm frozen or not. No, we hear you now. You're good. We hear you. We can hear you. You got me? We got you. We so, can hear you. Yeah, you're <laughs> welcome. Uh, we'd love to get everyone down there. Uh, collaborative. We hope to have... Uh, Six, seven hundred people down there of like-minded individuals. So come and uh, come and meet us and spend time with us down there. Terrific! We look forward to that live event, right? Definitely. <laughs> so, That's a winner. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. We're at nine oh two. I'm sorry, I'm two minutes off my game tonight, but it was a lot of exciting information. So thank you for being with us, and thanks again, Dr. Gallup, Dr. Moralia. I will follow up with the information of everything we discussed. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to see you, Michael. Thank Great you. Great to see you. Thank Good you. See you. Talk soon. Talk soon.